Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just giving it a couple or more minutes or seconds just for other attendees to join, and then we will start shortly. Hey, well, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us once again. My name is Hirschmuth. I'm the recruiting specialist for the College of Engineering located in Boston. So we know you guys are in for a very hectic, busy week. So thank you for taking the time and joining us. As we know, Northeastern is global. So I'm sure you guys are joining us from all parts of the world today. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever part you are joining, joining us today. So this is our Wonder Week webinar for wireless and network engineering as well as Internet of Things. I'm gonna go over some brief housekeeping rules as well as some general information from Northeastern, especially the College of Engineering. I'm gonna have it followed all by the professor that's joined us today, um, Professor Jornet, to go over the department. And then we're gonna wrap it up with some more admissions related housekeeping for applications and some of your next steps. So, just some rules that we like to just cover is code of conduct. So these are our code of conduct slides. This session is specifically geared for you to ask questions about the program and Northeastern. I'm highly encouraging and advising you not to ask questions specifically about your application or where it is at this point in time. That is something you could email us in the admissions inbox. If you do ask that question, I'll just, I'm just gonna provide you our email address because each student is at a different stage of their applications. So please, refrain from asking questions about your application and use this opportunity to ask questions about your the program specifics. As well as Northeastern reserves the right to accept students who have out to accept as well as to like dismiss students from webinars for, um, for just proper misconduct. So please be respectful to us as well as your um, colleagues that are joining us in this webinar. So of course, without further ado, when we talk about Northeastern, what are we, right? A lot of us know us for different reasons. Some of us know us for where we're located. Some of us know us for our ranking. So this is just a little glimpse of what Northeastern is about. We are a global university system. So there's a lot of opportunities within Northeastern. Outside of our Boston campus, we have other 13 other campuses within US, Canada, as well as London. We are a research school, so we are an R1 experiential research school, and we are very focused on that opportunity for students to join in research collaborations, as well as other networking events that you'll see throughout this presentation. As well as the university offers a comprehensive range of undergraduate and graduate degrees, along with PhD as well. So that you'll see that just at Northeastern, there's a lot of opportunities for students. When we talk about what Northeastern is, and stuff, we talk about our global network, right? A global network is where we're located. So within Northeastern, if the slide loads, just because of how big and vast we are, sometimes it takes a while for it to load. These are all of our global network campuses. So we are just, our main hub, our, our flagship campus, I would say, is our Boston campus. And then we go all the way down to Arlington. So our new additions are our Arlington campus, our Miami campus, and our Oakland campus. A lot of our campuses also go international as well. So we have a London team and we also have two campuses in Canada. So students have opportunities for a lot of just not taking courses or program at the campus you're allowed for, but there's also something that you guys are all aware of, which is co-op and co-op options are available all across um, the world and globe. It's up to you where you like to decide it. So Northeastern is about global scholars. So we have global scholars programs across as well as our global university features learning and opportunities that enhances just not just your academics as well as research and flexible education offerings. So within that realm, right, we focus on the College of Engineering. So this is a little snap of what we offer. Something that we definitely like to point out is that we are a top 32 engineering graduate school. So that has recently changed from last year. We have over 10,000 students on campus. However, we still, that may be a large number, but we still give you that one-on-one -on -one interaction from our staff and our faculty members as well. The College of Engineering offers over 100 educational programs. So that, that's a lot, and that's why our student body is large. That includes BS, MS, as well as PhD. 
minors and graduate certificates. A lot of our students also know us for our plus programs. So we have over 475 plus pathways to achieve an accelerated master's degree. So if you are a student that is looking for that, that's a great opportunity for you to be part of Northeastern as well for that option that students have. Our programs are interdisciplinary across all colleges. So there are going to be moments where you're going to meet with students from our school of law, our business. So we do do a nice knit of collaboration across all boards. So you're just not within just housed in the College of Engineering. According to research is something I'm going to talk about more, but we have over $92.5 million in research grants that a lot of our faculty work hard on getting. And a lot of students do a lot of research as well, as well as it's a key factor in their academics. So when we talk about what Northeastern is, so within our College of Engineering, there's six departments. So we go from bioengineering all the way to multidisciplinary education. So there's a vast options of programs, and within these programs, there's concentrations you could choose from as well. So we're talking about these programs and departments, right? You're like, oh, it's overwhelming sometimes, and it could be. But when you are working on that piece, this is how we basically break down what our academic programs look like. So within our school, we have nine PhD programs, 32 MS programs. A lot of our MS programs, of course, are all located at the Boston campus, but we also have some that are on a global campus network, which we have provided you as a breakdown of what programs are available at what campuses. And of course, we're continuously growing on that. And we're going to hopefully have all of our programs at all of our campuses at one point in time. So with all of that research, all of that determination that the school is doing, a lot of it goes for our faculty. Our faculty are a big point in making sure programs are being launched successfully and correctly. So these are what a lot of our program and faculty members do. They all, a lot of them are on a 10 year track. They have um, professional backgrounds. They've been in the industry as well as academics, or they're still currently still in industry practicing and all of that good stuff. So of course, to make sure that we, of course, keep up par, one of our beautiful buildings that I have here is our ISAC building, which is our interdisciplinary science and engineering complex. So this is our newest building on our Northeastern Boston campus, and it's great. There's over six story building. The, um, there's labs in there. There's like um, conference rooms in there. A lot of students just go there and hang out research. It's right where the um, our engineering library is, as well as our engineering school. So there's a lot of resources available for students, as well as we keep up with the current trends of like the way the market is. So this building, if you haven't been to our Boston campus, I highly encourage you to do so. It uses reusable energy, um, doesn't waste water, uses rainwater, it recycles it. So it's a really cool thing that we have on our Boston campus. But then research, like I've stated earlier, we have grants, 80%, um, there's an increase of 80% compared to other years. There's 18 disciplinary research centers and groups within Northeastern as well. So my students are like, or oh, when you're curious about what you could do, these are some things you could do. You could join groups. Um, our student ambassadors are a great platform for you as well that we'll discuss a little bit more further on, on how you could get encompassed in the spirit of Northeastern. So, these are our 18 research centers and institutes within Northeastern itself. So you have options across the board, especially more geared to your program that you're interested in or other programs or other associations you want to be part of. So these are some things you have. This is available on our website as well as it's available on our student ambassador page as well. Along with that, we talk about the COE mission, right? So what is Northeastern about? What is our department about? So it's an academic institution. Our main product is people. Our success, our success is based on the quantity and quality of the people we produce. So something our dean talks a lot about is good engineer solve problems. Great engineer solve important problems and transformative engineers discover and solve important problems. So at Northeastern, we produce transformative engineers, not just by students and faculty, but with the global impact, right? So each of us that are here today with you and you are part of that mission and are part of that transformative process within Northeastern. So how does that core play with our COE mission? So I'm gonna give it along to our my colleague on the screen and he's gonna discuss his program and how his program relates to our COE mission and how it moves forward with what Northeastern is about.
Excellent, thank you. And I guess that we'll go with the manual transitions when I ask you to, and let's let's go for this. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening or good night, everyone. I'm, my name is Jose Miquel Jornet. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And usually I give this presentation with my good colleague, Professor Stefano Bassani, but today you're only going to have to listen to me, so it's not too bad. Now, I want to talk about our two new programs, both Masters of Science, one focus on wireless and network engineering, and the other one focus on the Internet of Things. And I would like to start with a question next. That question is, imagine your life without wireless communications. Probably many of you are listening to this meeting from your cell phone, which is wirelessly connected through a cellular network or through Wi-Fi. Uh, many of you have been probably using you know, your wearable devices, whether it is your watch, your earphones. OK, you can keep all of those, but let's forget about their connectivity, right? So keep your cell phone, but keep it as a paperweight. No? Keep your earphones, but nothing is coming to them. Keep your wearable device. It's going to be great to tell you the time, but that's about it. And this applies to everything, right? For some people, this would be great, right? No more notifications, total freedom. For some people, that would be miserable. Oh my God, how do I interact? How do I work? How do I have fun? How do I shop? The conclusion is in the next slide that, you know, without wireless communications, your life would be different. And that's, that's the key idea. Now, wireless communication systems have changed a lot in the last 20 years. Maybe some of you, you know, were born at the same time of Wi-Fi, so early 2000s. Some of you might be older, you know, I'm, I'm older than that, not that much, but older than that. And we've seen different things, but okay, look, sure, we understand the past, we look at the present, but as an institute, what we are trying to do is to shape the future of wireless communications, right? The problems from the past have already been solved. The problems from today are not that fundamental anymore. What we need to solve are the problems of tomorrow. And at the Institute for the Wireless Internet of Things, which is one of the institutes that Harsh mentioned, we are working precisely on that. For example, probably many of you have a 5G phone. Well, what we're working are on the technologies that are going to be on your 6G phone. And I'll give you some examples in a couple of slides. We talk not only about the typical wireless communication networks, we also talk about nano networks, bio networks, quantum networks. All those things are happening here, mostly in Boston, but also in a few other campuses. We use artificial intelligence, not just, to, not just to operate the networks, but also to design the networks. Our goal is to make smart systems, smart systems relating to health, industry, agriculture, anything you can think of. And yes, we, we are quite comfortable sharing also that most of our research actually is done in the context of networking contested environments. So with the support of the Department of Defense, because after all, if you think, where does your internet come from? Where does your cell phone come from? Where does the GPS come from? They were all military technologies that eventually boiled down. So you can imagine that many of the things that we are doing will reach out, you know, the average user, maybe in 20 years, the first one to use it will be the ones that are paying for, and that's happened to be DOD. Let's go to the next slide. Now, um, why do we do all these things? First of all, we do them because we like them. And every faculty, every staff, every student in the institute enjoys what they are doing. But besides that, we are doing this because you know what? Current prediction says that there are going to be over 5 million jobs created in the next decade relating to wireless communications and networking that will affect everything. You know? And I think that that's quite obvious. Now, Diversity is key. Diversity both in the topics, and I'll show you some of the different works that we're doing, but also diversity of people in the sense that some jobs would be fine if you just have a bachelor's degree. Some jobs will be fine if you have a master's. For some jobs, you will have to go there only if you have a PhD. So we work actually with people at different levels of their career path. And that's our goal, right? We don't do this just because we like it. We do it because we see we need it. And actually, we, we learn many of these things from our industry partners that I will also present in a couple of slides. Let's move to the next slide. So in terms of diversity of topics, well, within the Institute, we have faculty and research groups working on very diverse applications. Some of them are on underwater networks. And for example, Professor Milica Stojanovic, in addition to Stefano and Professor Melodia and a few others, but Professor Stojanovic, he's very well known for her underwater works, are designing underwater sensors and vehicles that are able to monitor not just the quality of the water, but what's going on in the bottom of the sea, or even then predict if something is going to happen, like a tsunami. So we go all the way from underwater 
to surprise all the way to space. And for example, in my group, in which we're working on terahertz communications, which is something that we have been doing for 10 years, and finally now it seems that it's going to be in 6G, um, we're working also on space networks. And I'll give you, a, you know, an early preview that not even our dean knows this yet, but it was a couple of weeks ago that NASA approved the first launch of a satellite with terahertz radios in it. That satellite is actually being built by our undergraduate and graduate student club on aerospace and wireless communications and supervised by myself, um, Professor Melodia. So yes, that's the first satellite that Northeastern is launching. And that's a satellite that is going to be the first one in the world with 6G technologies developed anywhere, but in this case will be from the Institute and in collaboration with NASA. So those are the names that we work with. These are just some of the applications. Let's go to the next slide. I'll show you an even crazier one, which is that we also work on getting networks, for example, inside your body, I'm not talking just about making wearable devices, that this is kind of a, a given today. We're also trying to change the way in which we actually interface with others and with the internet, which is we're trying to create intra-body networks, networks that can be used for sensing, for example, to detect you know, lung cancer directly from blood, or to even recover or enhance the capabilities of the human brain through brain-machine interfaces. And I know that this sounds crazy and a little bit science fiction-y, but all these are projects funded by the National Science Foundation. Remember what Harsh mentioned, that we bring money from the US government and also industry to perform real research. We might be crazy, but we are not the only ones. And look, this type of bridging the gap between fictions, I mean, science fiction and actually science, that's what engineers do, right? And, and that's what we're trying to do. So we go all the way from the body to the next slide in which we also work a lot and we show you here on drone networks. That's another thing. Many colleagues think that, oh, if you have to do space, if you have to do drones, you need to go to mechanical. Sure, if you want to do a rocket system for the launch part, sure, you go there. If you have to design a propeller, sure, you go there. But if you need to make your systems intelligence able, not just to talk to you, but to talk to each other, to decide, then it's when it's, you need electrical and computer engineering because you need sensing and you need communications. And that's you know at the core of VCE. Now, if we go to the next slide, the idea is that we do this type of projects with different type of students, depending on you know, how far you are in your career. We work with undergraduate, master and PhD students on campus. Mostly right now it's in Boston, also the Rue Institute in Portland, excellent going, work going on with, on artificial intelligence for wireless. We work with postdoctoral researchers, people who already have a PhD but want to continue. But we even bring high school students over the summer and, work with, and we work with them for six weeks, and they are actually paid to work with us for six weeks over the summer on some of these projects. So then they hooked in and then they go on through their career. Let's go to the next slide. Now, um, we do this with state-of-the-art facilities, facilities that not even across the river here in Boston, not even MIT, Harvard, your, your Stanford, your Princeton, your Berkeley's have. For example, we have unique 5G and now we have upgraded to 6G experimental networks inside ISEC, this building that Harsh showed you. We have massive anechoic chambers and even drone nets that actually huge and they allow us to characterize electromagnetically, electrically, but also the, at the logical level, communications level, different type of things. And again, from cars to drones and anything in between. We're the home to Colosseum. Colosseum is the image that you see on the bottom left here in which this is the world's largest radio frequency emulator. Think of it as a supercomputer, but instead of being, soft, being used to solve some fancy equations, this is being used to emulate, for example, a new 6G technology in the city of Boston. So we have a virtual representation of everything in the city. And then we actually try to emulate the behavior of different protocols as users move or as users needs change. And in the bottom right, we're actually showing you a sneak peek of a terahertz testbed that we have built. We actually have the largest terahertz communications testbed in the world at this moment. And I'm not exaggerating and I'm not saying that just because it's mine. But it's, it's the result of many investments from US government and industry. And this is something that, for example, you also get to use in your courses, as we will talk in a couple of slides. Let's go to the next slide. Now, we do all these things with our industry partners. And actually, all these companies that you see here are not just companies that we work with. No, these are companies that are giving us money to work for them or to work with them. You have to think in the following way. I know that 
probably many of you think that, oh, when, when there is a new iPhone coming out, you think, oh, that's because Apple, right? They did a lot of in engineering and then they came up with something great. Mm, I, I, you know, I'm sorry to break your dreams, but actually innovation doesn't happen in industry. Real innovation happens in academia and happens in research laboratories, which are usually not part of companies. Let me put it in the following way. The goal of a company is to make money. And when an inversion is too risky, they, an investment is too risky, they are not going to do it. So what do they do? They come to us and said, look, uh, we would like to get to there, but we don't know what's the path. Or we know that there are this path, but we don't know which one is the good one. And you know, this is too high risk for us to try. Well, that's when they come to the university and that's why they work with us and the students to try to see those things that are too crazy for them to try, if we can try. And you know what's the beauty of the university? The beauty of a research university like Northeastern is that we'll try hard, we'll get something. If something works, that's great. If something doesn't work, well, then, you know, it's a learning experience. We know that doesn't work. No one gets fired. No one, no one loses a degree because of doing that. And that's why, again, industry works with us. If we go to the next slide. Now, um, Beyond companies, we like to make sure that the things that we develop, and by develop, we mean our, our students, our faculty, really reach people. And to reach people, it's not enough on just having an idea and writing a paper or making an invention. You need to make sure that, for example, you can legally use it. And if you want to create a wireless technology, that wireless technology needs to obey the rules of, sure, in the US first, the Federal Communications Commission, but even the Federal Communication Commissions need to obey the rules from the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU that you see here in the middle. That ITU is an organization with 143 countries, which are members of it. So the members are countries, not, in, not, not elements. Uh, and everything that the ITU says becomes law. So to give you an idea, Northeastern is one of the only 10 academic institutions that within the US has a direct communication line with ITU. This is something that we started when I joined here four years ago, and this has allowed us to really influence some of the things that you're going to see in 6G. This is just one of the examples. Everything else that you see in this slide are alliances, are consortiums in which Northeastern, the college, the department, and the institute are part of. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I keep talking about we, 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 the institute, who are these? Well, this is a bunch of faculty, a bunch of faculty that you see in this slide, uh, which are mostly faculty home in electrical and computer engineering, but we have also colleagues in computer science, mechanical engineering, business and, in, uh, and innovation. And again, these are the faculty that, as you're going to see in, a, in the next slide, these are faculty that you're going to see in your courses, in your programs, and if you want, in your research. So this is the institute. How do you join us? Well, if you are in this call, it's because you're considering to join at the graduate level, particularly with the first step, which is a master. So our institute, together with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering for the Master of Science and Wireless and Network Engineering, as well with Computer Science for the Master of Science in Internet of Things, have launched these two new programs. The first cohort of students start this fall, and the two programs have as a common thing to bridge disciplines. I'll explain that better when we move to the next slide. But before I do that, one thing, who are these masters intended for? Well, these are ideally for people who have some background or a bachelor's degree in engineering or computer science. The reality is that we're very flexible. And for example, as you will see for the master of science in Internet of Things, because it's a very interdisciplinary master, we would say, as long as you have some background in STEM, you know, even if it's math or physics or, or you know, any other type of STEM related discipline, we might be able to accommodate you. But with this in mind, let's go see the programs and then, of course, ask questions as we go through it. I'll answer them at the end. Let's start with the first, the Master in Wireless and Network Engineering. Next slide. So this is a program aimed at preparing who preparing highly qualified researchers and specialized workforce. So this is not a professional master in which we just try to get you on average with the industry. No, this is a like master's on science, which goal is to prepare you not just for today, but prepare you for tomorrow. And in particular in this masters, we want to prepare you to become a leader for the design, implementation and operation of you know, the wireless of the future in our hyper-connected society. 
To get there, you'll have to take courses. You might be able to do a master thesis if you want, and you can also get industry experience. Let me show you in the next slide how we are going to do that. Now, because before of that, let me tell you again, why do we do this? Well, look, in 2018, there were 3.9 billion users of the internet. And that number by the end of this year, 2023, it's supposed to be uh, 5.3 billion. Moreover, most of these devices are, or users are wirelessly connected. So, you know, we are, when, when you're thinking of the internet, when you're thinking of the access technologies to the internet, you cannot just think, oh sure, internet works, so, so that's it, right? There is water, there is electricity, no, there is internet. Well, as you can imagine, the way we use the internet is changing. And for example, right now, the next revolution is not just to use your internet with a screen and your voice, it's actually to be, for you to be part of the internet through holography and also through extended and augmented reality. And we need to redesign our networks just so we so can support, for example, you know, having this meeting you know, in a virtual space, maybe in a couple of years. So, you know, those networks that will be able to support these new applications are not going to design themselves, are not going to deploy themselves, are not going to operate themselves. Of course, artificial intelligence will play a game, but at the end of the day, you need someone with real intelligence. And that's what we want to make out of you. We want to take you to the next level. Let's go to the next slide. Now, how do we do that? Well, in this master's, you have two options. You can get your master's in wireless and network engineering by taking only courses or by taking courses and doing a master thesis. If you only want to take courses, there are you know, two courses that you will have to take, which are core courses. The rest are elective courses from a very long list. And if you want to do a master thesis, you'll take two courses, which are core courses, then four courses, which are electives, but then the equivalent of two courses becomes your master thesis. Go to, let's go to the next slide. Which are these courses? Well, the core courses, you can pick two out of these three. If you have never taken a class on computer networks or you only took a very basic undergraduate class on computer networks, then we ask you to take a, an advanced 7,000 level class on computer networks. If that's not your main thing, then you can directly jump to wireless communication systems. And if you already take the fundamental of computer networks and Sure, you're taking wireless cons, but you need a second course that's going to be mobile and wireless networking, which is uh, again 7,000 level class, so a little bit more advanced. So the idea is that you know we adapt to what you need, right? But the goal is to take you to, to the advanced, to the 7,000 levels. Okay. Now you take those courses, two out of these three, and then you have a bunch of elective courses on many, many, many different topics related to networking, from wireless sensor networks and IoT all the way to 6G terahertz, all the way to software defined networks, but also to even different type of courses, like courses on spectrum policy, for example, how, how to make your courses legal. In addition to these courses, which are based in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, in the next slide, we also list some of the courses that you can take from the College of Computer Sciences. And these are mostly courses uh, relating to, I would say, cloud computing, this and that. But usually what people like is the course on network security, which is something that we don't cover in ECE. Why? Because we don't need redundancy. We work with our colleagues in computer science. Next slide. Now, let's talk about the masters in Internet of Things. This is, again, a master of science. So this is not just a master that will just give you a master and then you go find a, a, a lousy job just an average job. This is a master in one. We want to prepare you to be a leader for what's coming up with the Internet of Things. So in the next slide, I show you exactly the details of this program. First of all, this master's is a master's that we started creating in the Institute for the Wireless Internet of Things. That was particularly Stefano, myself, and Tommaso, who is the director of the Institute, in which at which point we saw the benefit of bringing in computer science. So this is a joint program between the College of Engineering as well as the Curie College of Computer Sciences. And the big difference between this program and the program in wireless and network engineering is that in the program in wireless and network engineering, you mostly take courses on wireless and network engineering. Whereas in the program in the, of the Master of Internet of Things, we are actually preparing you for what the real Internet of Things is. And the Internet of Things is, at the very least, two things. It's the internet, it's the communications, whether it's wireless or wired, but it's also the things. It's actually, you know, the embedded systems, the hardware. So if you are the type of person who like to deal with hardware, you like to play with things, well, probably this is a better master's than, than the other. The other is, um, if you want, let me put it this way. 
if you if your only goal is to end up working at Qualcomm or Intel or you know Keysight, you, you go to the Master of Wireless and Internet of Things. If you want to expand maybe a little bit more and you know work on those companies or other companies more focused on the actual applications, or maybe you yourself are an entrepreneur, then maybe you come to these masters. In these masters, let's go to the next slide. What we have tried uh, to do is once again meet a need from the market, right? So by the end of this year. Predictions from Cisco tell us that there are going to be 14.7 billion machine to machine connections, right? So when we talk about the Internet of Things, what are we talking about? We're talking about networks of devices that collect data, that process data, that react to that data, and sure, the human can be in the loop, but it's mostly machine to machine communication. That's why we need many things to happen here, right? We, we need to talk, for example, we need to talk about how we make those devices, how we make those sensors. But we also need to talk about other things, like for example, the legalities. You know, you know, the data has more value the, the more sensitive it is. In other words, the more private that the information we're collecting <laughs> is, the more value that the data has. So there are a bunch of legal aspects that you will also learn in this in this program. So let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a master, and you can just keep clicking. This is a master that started at the Institute for the Internet of Things. But as you can see, has been involving pretty much every college on campus. Literally, most of the courses are EECE or computer science. But then for your freedom, the elective courses, we had we had picked courses from. Imagine that you say, I want to apply IoT for medical sciences. So we took courses from our Bobet College of Health Sciences. And you say, you know what? I'm more intrigued about the, you know, I want to make a business. I want, I have an idea. I want to learn how to commercialize it. We pick courses from our school of business, the Damore McKim. And you can go through all these examples, right? So we pick courses for you that are ready, that you can find. You're going to see in a couple of slides. And, and that's our, you know, those are what you need to get your master's in IoT. So how do you get your master's? Once again, in this case, you're going to be able to take you know, a lot of courses. So, I mean, all the masters are eight courses. In this case, however, the difference is that seven courses will come from courses that I'm telling you exactly what I want you to take. So the master's in, in wireless and networking, it's freedom. You only take two out of three that I pick, then you have six courses of freedom. In this master's, you know what? No, I'm telling you exactly what I want you to take because I know what the market needs, not just because I, I, I think I know everything, but because I listen. I listen to former students. I listen to our industry colleagues. I read the news. And when I say we, I, I mean we at the Institute. So there is only two options. Either you take only courses or you take mostly courses, but one small research project. It's not enough to be a master thesis. Master thesis are need to be eight credits. But if you want, you can also get some research experience. Next slide. Now, which are the courses that you will have to take? Well, first of all, you will have to take the courses on Internet of Things, which is wireless sensor networks and Internet of Things. That's, you have to take it. Then we'll ask you to choose between one of the two courses on communications, whether it's the wireless comms with its 5,000 or the more advanced mobile and wireless networks, which is a 7,000. Then you will have to take a course on algorithms. Why? You'll say, I already know algorithms. Well, you have to take a graduate course on algorithms at Northeastern, whether from ECE or from computer science, because we need to make sure that you are ready to then take a course on machine learning. And that's, again, you have to take one course on machine learning out of the four options that we give you here, either from ECE or from computer science. After that, we said the Internet of Things is two things, right? It's the Internet and the things. So yes, you will have to take one course either on embedded systems, if you've never done that, or if you already know your embedded systems, let's go into jam into, for example, the hardware aspects of sensing. Because at the end of the day, the Internet of Things, it's nothing but a massive platform to collect data. Data means money, therefore the Internet of Things makes money. And that's why maybe some of you are interested. So these are five of the courses that you have to take. Let's go to the next slide. There are two more courses that you have to take, yes or yes. The first one is a course on entrepreneurship, policy, and business. And this is very new. We're asking all of you to go through a course from our colleagues in the Damore McKim School of Business. We want to prepare you to be entrepreneurs. We want that if you have a great idea, you don't just go and say, and, you know, and, and say sure, I have an idea, I make a school project. No, if you have a good idea, you go become rich, then you send us back money and we put a name in your building. Okay, just I mean, they're joking, but no, wait, maybe not. Maybe some of you will be convinced. And of course, we also ask you to take a course in security. 
precis precisely, you know, security when it applies to IoT is critical because look, when you deal with software security, the worst thing that can happen is that someone steals the money in your bank account. Sure, none of us is rich, so that would not be the end of the world, and that's very unlikely to happen. But when someone can control your car, when someone can control your home, they can create physical damage. So actually, that's the type of security that we are aware, afraid of. That's why we force you to take one course. And yes, I use the course, the word force. We force you to take a course in security. Now, what's the last option? Because I went through seven courses. There is one thing missing. So if we go to the next slide, these are some of the colleges that are involved into offering you elective courses. And for example, if you care about making smart infrastructure, then you'll go and take a course from mechanical and industrial engineering. If you care about our course on you know, bioengineering, we pick some of them. Civil engineering, the same. If you say, I actually like the business part, we offer you more courses from business. You say, no, I want to go into health. Go to the health sciences college. We, pick, we already pick courses for you. It's not that you are lost. No, no, this is a very guided program. We want to carry your hand, show you everything, then you still get to pick some more. And of course, maybe some of you decide to stay with us for a longer time, but that's another story. And this and that. The next few slides, Harsh, you can just go because it's just an example of some of the courses that, that they can take. Okay, actually, no, I removed those. That's good. So there is a long list of courses that if you care, you can reach out to me, but we already picked those for you. So don't worry. Now, for both programs, all the companies that the college has connections to, they are available to you. But in addition to that, there are many companies that work directly with us, with the faculty for our research. Well, those companies are aware of our new master programs and they are willing to accommodate some of you going on to co-op with them, provided that you, know, you do well while you are with us and provided that your interest along with their interest. Not all these companies have co-op all the semesters, right? Only some of them. Um, and there needs to be an alignment. Uh, I want to say that uh, our institute has a good reputation in the country. People know that Northeastern is a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a poll for wireless communications research. So we will not let you go to industry, at least with our endorsement, unless you're doing well in the courses. So I'm not saying this because I want you to think, I don't want to go to Northeastern, life is very hard. No, at Northeastern, you have many options. There are masters that if, you want, if your goal is to just get a quick degree and go job as a cashier, sure, you can go get some of those, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to make you leaders in communications and networks and IoT. And well, we'll try to give you our endorsement uh, if you do well when you're with us. I think I have one more slide. Or maybe not. I don't remember. It's okay. Really I think that, that's it. Perfect. Yes. So that's, that's it. That's you. Go for but it. But I love it. Appreciate it. I love all the energy. So yes, just like he said, right? It, Northeastern is it has a lot of options. And just with a lot of those options, you probably want to know like what are your options or like who's there to help you. So um, a great resource that we have are graduate ambassadors. The graduate ambassadors are current Northeastern students that have been in your shoes, that have joined us on webinars, have visited our campus, have met with faculty members, have exchanged emails, and they are finally enrolled and they're students. So these are people or students just like you that you can reach out to to ask any program specific questions, what to expect. So if you're someone that's moving to Boston, you want to know about housing, student life, like even like places to eat, places to like just have fun. These are great resources for you to connect with. There is a link, but there is also a QR code that you could scan with your 5G phones. And then that'd be a great way for you to also connect with them and have a text conversation with them. So what do our ambassadors do and what they don't do? So they can answer any questions regarding your department specific um, specific program questions, or even the courses that were just spoken about. A lot of our students take courses within other, just not COE, with other universities and colleges within Northeastern. So you could ask them about, oh, how is the school of business or what professor, what faculty member do you recommend? Coursework, relocation, like I stated earlier, and there's things to do on Northeastern campus itself. There's a lot going on. This week is, if you're visiting our campus this week, it's super quiet because it is finals week. So like our faculties are super busy creating papers or exams and giving them out. Some things you cannot do is your application eligibility, right? Application is specifically something that comes out of our office of admissions. The size of our applications come from us. So you have to email our admissions office. Registration, they can't help you with that either. Anything regarding to visa payments or anything like that, that goes through our different offices of Office of Global Services, as well as our financial aid. 
But like I've stated, they could help you with a lot of endless opportunities for student life and engagement. So this is the QR code I was talking about. You're more than welcome to connect with them. You could text them through WhatsApp, Weibo, Facebook, and Instagram. They're very active. They're also working around the clock as well. If you have specific questions, of course, email them as well. And I know a lot of questions that do come in from students, like, how do we get involved? Like, what are what is there to do outside of just academia and industry? And so that's something that we definitely have at Northeastern. There's a lot of ways to get involved within the College of Engineering or just at Northeastern as a whole. So these are some of our student um, clubs that um, students have put together with the help of other students or previous students with faculty members and staff members. So these are some great um, clubs you could join as being a student at Northeastern. You don't have to wait at any point in time. You can start from the first day you are on the campus of Northeastern, even in your second semester or year. So definitely get involved. It's a great way for network, great way for building on collaborations with industry as well as other faculty members as well. This also allows you to do things and build on your resume because like we stated earlier, co-op is something that a lot of students are very excited for about Northeastern. And this co-op is not a requirement. It is something that you have the privilege to sign up for. And there are some courses and um, things, requirements you have to maintain to do co-op. So these are some things you could talk to our student ambassadors about as well. Where do they do their co-op? Where do they plan on doing their co-op? So this is just a little blurb that what we offer is CPT advising and all these other services. So within Northeastern, there's a lot of resources for you. It's just you just they're, they're there. So definitely use them and have that part of your career at Northeastern or your plan. So something, of course, is your next steps, right? So where do you stand in the line and what do you do? So first, if you've been already received your acceptance letter, so we'd like to congratulate you on that. The following steps, once you receive your acceptance letter, is paying your enrollment de deposit. If you don't pay your enrollment deposit, it won't open up anything else for you, and your acceptance letter will address that. Once you do that, you want to claim your Northeastern account. Once you claim your Northeastern account and you have received clearance, that is when you can apply for I-20. Because I know that's a really popular question that I did see is regarding I-20s. So you have to get cleared to apply for I-20 first, once that is done, then you will follow the steps in your email on regarding your I-20 process. If you are a student that does not require I-20 and you just need to do your housing and stuff, you just want to follow the housing track as well. This is available in your um, student um, acceptance letter package as well as this recording. And this session will be shared on our um, COE Graduate Ambassador YouTube page. So you're more than welcome to reference back to it at any time as well. But let's say if you are someone that still hasn't thought about submitting an application to Northeastern, right? So you have until June 1st to submit your application. You still have some time. And then, of course, if you are a student that's already inside the U.S. and a domestic student, you have until August 1st. I, however, would not recommend you to wait until then. I recommend you to submit your application as soon as possible. And then, of course, what goes in your application, right? So, like I've stated, deadlines are different for domestic and international, but what we require is the same for all students. An application fee of $75, that, of course, is waivable because you've joined us today. So, you will receive a follow up email with the fee waiver code that you could use, so as a recommendation, unofficial transcript, statement of purpose, as well as an essay, and then, of course, um, English proficiency exams. Something to note, your English proficiency exams have to be sent official. We will not accept a PDF of it. They will not count as part of your application, so your application will stay incomplete. So I know that's a very common, like we understand the PDFs of some schools or some programs do accept it. Unfortunately, we at Northeastern don't, so you do have to submit the official ones. And then, of course, once you submit your application, there's a lot of things you have questions about or, or just want to connect with someone, these are our email addresses that you could reach out to, as well as we have an FAQ page on our um, College of Engineering website. They probably have the questions you're look. you probably have, they probably have the answers to the questions you're looking for. So that's a great resource for you to also address or look into. But at any point in time, feel free to reach out to our College of Admissions office, and then we will get back to you within 24 to 48 hours as well as if you have any application questions as well. So here at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing our screens and then we are gonna allow you 
to access any questions you have. We have like five more minutes of this session, which will organically end on its own, but we definitely wanna answer your questions as soon as possible and get you to the correct answers that you are seeking. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then we'll answer some of your questions that you guys have in the chat. I already see Joseph is already like answering them. So that's awesome. That's great. But yeah, let me I was wondering, do you want me to try to answer some live? And I think some maybe you can answer. Sure. So if you want to, if you see a rep repetition of certain specific questions, you can answer them live. But I'll answer some. So I see how many co-ops can you do? So that's a great question. Um, co-ops are technically of how the way you program yourself, right? You could do a three-month co-op, a six-month co-op, or an eight-month co-op. So it's definitely up to you. Um, you are given a co-op advisor. So co-op advisors advisor will help you in navigating yourself. What other colleges do at Northeastern is different. Of course, I can't speak about that, but this is what we do at North, um, at the College of Engineering, that there's options for you to do co-op. Well, it's great to hear, Emmanuel, that you already have your admissions to um, IOT. So we congratulate you on your acceptance. If you have any questions regarding your next steps, just um, send us an email at our admissions office. And we'll definitely have those available and answer to you. Okay, so I see questions like, for example, right? And then, you know, I'm prospective still in the master's in IoT. I would like to take 10 courses instead of eight. Uh, is there a limit on the 32 credits? And actually, I don't know the answer. So do we know cards? Can the students take more than the minimum? So it honestly would depend on the advisor and it depends yeah. on how your course, like, so if you need, like, for you to move on to like course B, you have to take course A. So I don't think simultaneously you could take multiple courses at once. Um, so that will be given by that. Um, your academic advisor will help you with that piece. But I also would say you want to also enjoy grad school. You don't want to rush through it because you want to take the opportunity of co-op, getting involved with student groups or organizations, because that also helps with bringing your brand awareness, also helps in building your network um, of like people you want to connect with and also all those things. So I would say take your time. Don't rush it. Our programs are within like a two years time span anyways. So definitely, I would advise you to reach out to an academic advisor and they could probably answer those questions too, or even a, um, a student ambassador would be able to, but I don't think you could take that many courses at once. I know that was a long answer, but yeah. I see also questions says, look, uh, for the master's in Internet of Things, you know, what should I do, courses or thesis, what do you recommend? Look, I would really say the same. You first get here to campus. Uh, first of all, you, you don't need to choose the first day, right? This, we will go with the flow. And then you will see it, right? If you're taking courses and you suddenly think, oh, I like what this professor is doing, or I've seen, you know, we have many events during the year. We have workshops, we have industry days, we have many events. And you suddenly get to see, oh, I like what's that going. I would like to work in his or her group. That's when you start thinking if you do research or not, right? The other thing is the following. To do research, it's, you know, usually if you have never done research before, this is going to be your last chance ever uh, in the sense that no one goes into a PhD without never having done research. So if you don't know if you want to, if, you're, if your master's is the last stop in your education, uh, if you know that your master's is the last stop, you can do research if you want, but that's fine. If you are considering of going to PhD, then I strongly recommend you to try to do some research because then your PhD is going to be doing research. So how can you choose something that you have no idea about what it is? But I would say at this moment, you don't have to decide. Just, you know, you are admitted, congratulations, get on campus, you'll be with us for two years and I will have plenty of time to discuss. No one needs to decide anything on day one. What else do we see here? Uh, uh, that's a question that we always get, and I think Harsh probably have the official answer. So, you know, are there teaching assistantships or, or research assistantships for these programs? I can tell you my side of the story, which is like, you know, this at the end of the day, it's a program in the College of Engineering. So the opportunities are the same as for other programs. Teaching assistantships are handled in this case because these both masters are core in the electrical and computer engineering. The teaching assistantships are handled by the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And yes, of course, you can apply for those, but you know, there are many students that are going to be applying. And if every student asks for a TA ship, I'm telling you, you know, not every student get it. But the door, the, the conditions are the same for any other program. For research assistantships, uh, well, that's 
that you need to convince an advisor, right? Resource assistantship comes from, you know, hard and money from industry, National Science Foundation, and those are tied to a specific project. If you ask me, well, um, in general, I would not give research money to a student that has never worked with me before, but I'm not the only one in the Institute. So just saying that. I don't know if Harsh, you want to add anything else, but. Yeah, and outside of, I, and we understand the cost of the graduate programs are expensive, but just remember your co-ops are paid programs. Um, they're, you're getting paid what the market is getting paid, right? So your salary could go, your hourly wage go from 20 to like 60 to $80 an hour. So while you're in co-op, you're not paying tuition, like you're completely off the tuition grid and you're working. So that's a good way for students to make money. Um, you're also allowed to work on campus for other jobs as well. So student ambassador work, a lot of departments have student ambassadors. Our admissions office has that of course as well. So there's always other opportunities for employment um, within the university. You. Everyone, like I've been putting in the chat, you're more than welcome to shoot our um, admissions office an email and we can look into your application and see if you're eligible for any funding or any like additional scholarships that is available. But there's a lot of other opportunities as well. So don't let the cost hinder you to like consider Northeastern at any point in time. Yes. Um, I see some questions that are related to so maybe I can answer them. So I see, first of all, it's IoT and electronic communications uh, the same. And then I also see someone who says, oh, but isn't IoT also software? I didn't see software development. So the idea is the following. IoT, as I said, it's two things, right? It's the internet and the things. Those things are hardware, of course, and those things need to be programmed. And then, of course, those things need to communicate to the over the internet. So yes, there is the internet and there is the app and there is the cloud. All these things, the basis of it are giving you in the first core course that you have to take, which is the 5155 wireless sensor networks and IoT. That's a course that follows the data path. In other words, you start talking about sensors, then you talk about computing, then you talk about the embedded systems, then you talk about the communications, the streaming, to end up talking about the cloud, and finally about data analytics, uh, everything in one course, right? So that will give you the big picture. Then among the electives that you can take, there is pretty much everything you can imagine, right? Uh, but what I would say is at the master level, we expect that, you know, you know how to program, uh, that if you have never taken a course on embedded systems and you're not familiar with real-time operating systems, you'll have an opportunity to let that in the IoT class or some of the elective courses. And if you're more interested in programming the cloud, that's another thing that you, you'll get exposed into that course but then you can pick more electives. Again, we don't show the list with all the electives because there are more than 100 options. So that's that's the bottom line. But again, difference between IoT and electronics communications. I don't know what you mean by electronics. I mean, I know what you mean, electronics and communications. And yes, they are part of IoT. I don't know if you refer to a specific problem or anything like that. But that's, that's the answer. I see a question about Empower. Uh, and I think Hearts probably can re... re, re Reply. One thing that I want to say is that, look, I applied for Empower, but I didn't see Master in Internet of Things. These masters are very new, right? The fall is going to be the first course, so maybe they didn't show in the system, but I don't know if Hearts can elaborate. I, I'm not familiar myself with the Empower thing. Yeah, I've emailed a student. Um, okay. You probably want to contact Empower directly and have and conversate with them because, I, unfortunately, myself, I'm not familiar with Empower as well. Okay, so I'm typing one of the answers for others. That is good. We already replied the research thing is. So what level of program profici level proficiency? Again, so when you think of the master in wireless and network engineering, then we're thinking of, for example, we have the course on network programming. I believe that depends to up the instructor, but it's C++ or Python mostly. Um, we expect that you know how to program. If not, again, we're a university, so we're supposed to be able to tell you where to go and look. Uh, don't get obsessed. It's not about how many languages you know how to program, it's whether you know how to program or not, right? So to give you an idea, many of the fundamental courses are, are not even taught using a specific language. They are taught in pseudocode. So we, we teach you how to think. Then the language you use it to implement it, it's your problem, but, but that's where we are. Okay. Uh, and maybe, yes, for some of these very specific questions, I think you can just follow over email, maybe, that's it. 
I think we covered everything. Yes, uh, yes okay. we did. So we have one more minute left of the session. So if you guys have any additional questions, please put them in. Um, if you were not able to get to your questions, just send us an email to our admissions inbox and we will definitely have them answered. We could ask the department to just give us an answer. We'll forward um, your email to them or they'll just respond to us and we'll send you. But we thank you all for joining us today. Um, depending on where you were, it must have been really late or really early. So we appreciate your time. And I hope this session was helpful. This session was recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube page, as well as you will receive a follow-up email um, regarding the link to this session for you to kind of, for you to reference back to at any point in time. But um, I think we've answered majority of the questions um, regarding anything along those lines. I just am gonna just answer this one. You mentioned co-op option as a means of funding to the tuition. So co-op is paid, right? So you're gonna, it's your base, it's like basically an industry job. So you will receive a paycheck from the company. You could use those funds to pay off your tuition, pay off your housing. It's anything you wanna pay off um, at that point, right? So it's money that you're getting in your pocket. Northeastern doesn't get that money, that goes to you. All right, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joseph, for joining us as well. And I hope this session was helpful for everyone. Take care. Thank you.